glad to see that we still have so many people this late on a Friday afternoon. Uh, this is our third panel of the evening, and uh, my name is Sonia Colina. I'm in the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. I'm the moderator for the panel, and uh, I'm going to introduce our uh, three next uh, panelists. And uh, they're like uh, Professor Adji just mentioned, we have a variety of people from different departments the university and this panel I think is a very good example of that, like other panels we've seen today. So we have Professor Yoranda Almeida uh, from the Department of French and Italian, Professor David uh, Christensen, right? Did I get it right? Sometimes I get the Christensen's then confused. Uh, and the Department of German Studies, I'm sorry, Classic. classics, sorry, trying to work by memory, and Professor Thomas Kovac in the Department of German Studies. The way we're going to do this uh, is first, they're all going to tell us a little bit about um, their work with translation. Um, as David mentioned earlier, uh, you have detailed bios on the program, so now they're going to give us a little bit of detail about their uh, present projects on translation. And then I have a couple of what I think are somewhat interesting questions and that hopefully uh, will stir up a little bit of uh, debate in the audience. And I'll first give them the chance to answer those questions, the panelists, and then hopefully we'll get a little bit more uh, audience involvement. Okay. All right, so Professor Zabeda. Oh, you get your own. Yeah, you're right. Oh, hi. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> OK. Um, I am uh, the, my first work of translation was the translation of a novel by Chinua Achebe, whom, as you know, uh, who, as you know, uh, passed away uh, last week, as I was at the, uh, uh, um, the Conference of the African Literature Association. So it was a sad event, but it was good that there were 400 people there who deal with African literature who could do a memorial for him. So the book was it's, it's Achebe's third book, uh, Arrow of God. And I translated it into French with a friend uh, under the title La Flèche de Dieu. Now, I would very much like to translate this book again because I translated it 20 years ago. And I feel that I have a little more experience today to do a better job at it. So I'm in negotiation with uh, Présence Africaine in Paris to see if they're going to allow me to retranslate it, especially since nobody else did another translation of that book. Now, um, I think we're going to come back to this later because, uh, well, maybe I'll make just one point about that book because I am from Benin in West Africa, a French-speaking country, translating a book by uh, a Nigerian with an Anglophone, mm -hmm. and who is also an Igbo within the Nigerian society, so with a very distinctive culture. So I will talk about the, the challenges if, if we have time. My second uh, translation work uh, is the one that is on display outside, and it's a translation of African women's poetry uh, even though I'm not officially the translator of that book, because what I did was more the work of gathering all this work that African women have done, and which has remained invisible, you know, even within the French-speaking world, let alone the English-speaking world. So that's another definition of translation, that this transfer of knowledge from one language to the, to the other. And then um, the, <clears throat> the colleague who was working with me, who is uh, an African-American, so her language is English. Um, so we, that's why I was interested in that uh, um, concept of uh, what, in which language you translate in, you know, where you are more um, at ease. So, uh, but what I'm working on now and that I'm very passionate about is on translating oral traditions by women in FON, F -O -N, which is one of the main languages spoken in Benin. So I was on sabbatical last year, spent a whole year in Benin collecting all this poetry uh, 
but it, I mean, there are many challenges. The first is that it's poetry in form that I have to translate into English, into French, and eventually into English. So we have a translation of a translation. And also because it's oral tradition, it, uh, how do you translate pitch? How do you translate you know, the chanting? How do you translate? I mean, there's so many questions that we, uh, yeah, that we, um, we can talk about later. So I want to, that's all I want to say now. OK, so we can come back to it. Yeah. OK, am I audible? No. Should be on, right? Should be on. Yeah. Uh, what about now? Nothing? What about now? Let's must not be looking at Yes. All right. Thank you. Uh, I unfortunately wrote something up ahead of time after I did not have the advantage of Professor Raji's wonderful talk, which I, I learned a lot from. So this will, this will give a much less nuanced view of the relationship between source and, and um, target text. But here goes. Okay. The focus of my current and previous translation projects has been ancient Roman comedy and the Roman comic playwright Plautus in particular. Plautus wrote and produced plays around 200 BCE, just after the Romans had taken a major step toward acquiring an empire by defeating Carthage in the Second Punic War. Roman literature thus grew out of imperialism, as its creation was part of Rome's project to establish a cultural identity as it militarily and politically colonized Europe. Greek culture and literature were rapidly being absorbed by the Romans when, when Plautus came onto the scene, though not without conservative resistance to the newfound cosmopolitanism in Rome. Drama came first in Latin literature because the Roman soldiery had enjoyed theatrical productions of Greek plays while on campaign in Hellenized regions of southern Italy. One outcome of this early explosion of Roman interest in drama was the survival today of 20 complete or nearly complete Latin comedies adapted from Greek sources by Plautus. Until relatively recently, classicists had only begrudgingly accepted Plautus's chronological primacy in Latin literature. Plautus's plays were mostly marginalized as degenerate translations of presumptively superior, albeit almost entirely lost, source plays of Greek New Comedy. Classicists dismissed Plautus's plays as linguistically frenetic and extravagantly jokey corruptions of their sources. And given their general disregard for consistent development of character and plot, they could not as readily be made to conform to modern traditions of theatrical naturalism as could surviving specimens of other new comedy playwrights. It thus was generally agreed that the best use to which Plautus's plays could be put was to reconstruct their lost or highly fragmentary Greek source texts. In the late 1980s, my choice of Plautus as one of my special authors for my comprehensive exams in my Ivy League PhD program was mostly met with snickers from my peers and professors, apparently because up to that point I had been thought to be a capable and serious student. <laughs> Extensive 20th century papyrus finds of the Greek new comic playwright Menander, however, have gradually revealed that the lost Greek comedies behind Roman drama were not all they had been cracked up to be, and that Plautus adapted his sources more liberally for his target audience and to better effect than had been presumed. Near the end of the 20th century, a few scholars began to look more closely at the extant text of Plautus as scripts for performance and demonstrated that the plays were much richer when imagined as complex spectacles enacted at a particular historical moment. Much of the performative power and interest of Plautine comedy is in fact derived from the shifting dynamics of actors and audience. And it turns out that Plautus in some ways is a very modern and thoroughly metadramatic playwright. Plautine metatheater goes far beyond clever quips about the play's status as a performance in progress in that it aggressively exposes the underpinnings of Plautine comedy, especially its conventions, its stock roles in role playing as the constructions they are. Contemporary Roman society was deeply theatrical in its scripting of public events, as seen especially in its spectacular, spectacular religious rituals, military triumphal processions, elite funerals, and even the daily obligations of political patronage, 
all of which enacted an, an, an often elaborate social script, firmly grounded in rules and conventions designed to affirm social hierarchies and relationships of power. A Roman of this period who had seen any form of drama would easily have grasped the meaning of the Shakespearean dictum, all the world's a stage. It seems, no example, it seems no accident, for example, that in this age of fierce competition among the elite for the right to celebrate military triumphs in, a, in association with empire building, several plotine comedies feature a braggart soldier drawn to absurdly egotistical extremes. The study of plotine metadrama holds much potential for shedding light on the, na on the nature of Roman society in the dynamic period of economic and social change following the Second Punic War, especially as it relates to such issues as the effects of new cultural influences, the possibilities for social m mobility or rebirth, personal and group identity, gender, sexuality, and otherness. My own scholarly work outside translation largely focuses on how Plautine comedy addresses these kinds of issues within the confines of state-sponsored dramatic festivals and in so doing subtly interrogates Roman systems of power. This reinvigorated interest in Plautus has resulted not only in fresh scholarly studies of the plays in their ancient performative context, but has also opened the way to revival performances and to a number of new translations which, like my own, actively bring an awareness of recent scholarly developments to the translation enterprise. In the prefaces of my two published volumes of translations of Roman comedy, I emphasize that I translate for the classroom and that my primary aim, aim is to provide students with a readable and well-informed introduction to the plays and to the distant cultural environment in which they were produced. Although the striking similarities between ancient and modern colloquial conversation often lead to readily domesticated English dialogue in translation, overall I aim to retain the foreignness of ancient Rome in general and the strangeness of Plotine verbal prolixity in particular. Plotus abounds in neologisms, hyperbole, and often bizarre and baroque conceits, which, when left relatively undomesticated, may seem as unexpected and jarring to a modern audience as they were meant to be for an ancient one. One simple method I use to broadly preserve the otherness of the source text and perhaps induce students to appreciate differences in that source text and its culture, even if they are reading in their own language, involves not modernizing the names of the characters and leaving in references to Roman and Greek places persons, deities, personified abstractions, institutions, currency, and the like. These are explained in notes at the bottom of the page or less frequently in appendices. The same treatment generally extends to Roman cultural beliefs, values, assumptions, and ideologies. And thanks to a sympathetic publisher, this process of defamiliarization can be carried out at the most minute linguistic level. For example, a common Latin way of of expressing the proverbial, the, perver the proverbial notion stuck between a rock and a hard place is between the knife and the victim. In these instances, I literally translate the ancient proverb or give a, a domesticating equivalent, but in either case, include a brief note on the prevalence of animal sacrifice in the ancient world and its pervasiveness in the colloquial lexicon. I, of course, acknowledge that this degree of foreignization may not be a reasonable goal for all translations. For my first two volumes of translations, I was most fortunate to have worked with Focus Publishing, a press in Boston well established in my field for its translations of ancient drama that allows translators to include notes on the pages of the translated text, which greatly increases the chances that students may actually read them. I had to negotiate for notes on the page in, in, the, current, in the contract for my current translation project with Oxford University Press, whose normal practice is to relegate notes to the back of their editions. These notes can be interpretative as well as merely informative. In the case of Plotine metadrama, for example, I often include a, br a brief explanatory note about the possible metatheatrical import of something a character says when this is not immediately obvious. And in the more obvious cases, such as when the playwright figure of Plotus's Casna, Cleostrata, who at the play's end, after she has subjected her lecherous husband to a humiliating transvestite punishment, arbitrarily declares that she will forgive him, quote, only because this play is long enough as it is, unquote, 
I include a note referring the reader to a general discussion of Plotine metatheater in the introduction of the volume. This kind of interpretive direction clearly illustrates how translations may be inscribed within current scholarly discourse on the source text. I do not apologize for this sort of interpretive, interpretive transparency, as translation, like scholarship, is an historicized cultural product, and we should not pretend otherwise. And this is just one reason, in the case of ancient Greek and Latin texts, to be sure, why commonly read works should be retranslated every generation or so. Thank you. Do I need this one? Can you hear me? OK. Thank you. Um, so I'm going to, uh, as you suggested, come out of the closet and talk about my early experiences in translation before I get to my professional work. And I'm thinking back to studying German in college, where I learned the language for the first time. And uh, believe it or not, uh, I was taught in the now totally discredited grammar translation approach, uh, which had one advantage, uh, not that I'm advocating it, but it did make me aware of translation from a ver very early stage of my kind of engagement with the German language. In my college days, uh, we were very immersed in the works of Thomas Mann. That was really the dominant figure in my studies. And because I was just learning the language and sort of struggling with it, I did consult translations quite a bit. And back then, there was only one translation available of Thomas Mann's works. It was the translation of Helen Lowe Porter, which struck me as rather stuffy Victorian in style. She also made a number of blunders, which even I, as a second or third year student, could spot. Um, but it just didn't seem to me faithful to the style and spirit of Munn's texts. And so I remember when I was now in graduate school in comparative literature, I did sit in on a workshop on translation. And for that, I submitted my version of a translation of the first paragraph of Thomas Mann's Der Tod in Venedig, Death in Venice. Those of you who know the work know it's about this writer who is in this very overwrought state of mind from the very beginning of the text. And that psychological state is conveyed by the very convoluted prose, which of course German is known for, but uh, this is particularly convoluted. And of course, Helen Lowe Porter in her translation had broken it down into many easily flowing English sentences, which had none of the feel of the original, I felt. So I tried to replicate this totally convoluted syntax in my English translation. And I'll never forget the response of the professor who was leading this workshop. He looked at it and said, that's not English. And this did teach me a lesson that, you know, however much we try to think we can manipulate our target language to accomplish an expressive goal, every language has its own parameters that must be taken into consideration. And this is a lesson I learned early on. Now, you know, just uh, quickly referring to the theme of this panel, translation as scholarship, and in what sense it is, I can sort of confess that for much of the early part of my career, apart from doing sort of various projects to serve community requests or colleagues' requests, uh, I wasn't really engaged in translation professionally as part of my scholarly profile until more recently. Um, I was involved in a publication of essays and also poems by the um, by the German-Jewish uh, philosopher Franz Rosenzweig. And then, uh, just moving on, in 2002, I published, I edited a volume of essays on the Viennese writer Hugo von Hofmannsthal that I had written my dissertation in another book on. And a couple of the uh, submissions to that volume were in German, so I had to translate them. <clears throat> a couple of years later, my colleague Steve Martinson edited a volume in the same series on Friedrich Schiller, and one of those essays was in German, and he asked me to translate. So, you know, this was my first sort of professional experience, in this case, translating uh, academic prose into English. Um, then, uh, more recently, I published a volume <coughs> consisting of speeches and essays by a contemporary German writer, Martin Walser, uh, 
all related to Germans dealing with the Nazi past and how that has really impacted German national identity. Um, so my volume consisted of translations of his texts as well as introductions and commentaries. Um, now, what's interesting about these works is that uh, the, the genre is kind of slippery. I mean, on the one hand, you might think, well, this is a writer functioning as a public intellectual, you know, declaring his stance on various issues in public life. But Walzer would often kind of retreat into very literary devices, for instance, jumping into third person forms. Um, and so, you know, this was, in a way, an initial encounter in, with literary translation as well. Um, I've more recently translated a novella by another contemporary German writer, Peter Schneider, uh, which is a very, also a very loaded one. It is, it is fictional, but it is clearly based on the testimonies of Rolf Mengele, the son of the notorious Auschwitz doctor, Josef Mengele, and uh, it's had a very kind of rocky history because of that. Um, but I don't want to get into that right now, although we can talk about it more later. I guess, you know, what I want to sort of bring out is the different genres involved in translation, you know, from philosophical essays to academic articles to speeches and essays which have some literary flavor, then finally to a clearly literary work of fiction. I do think that the whole topic of genre is a very important one because to me the rules of the game are quite different depending on the genre. Um, and, you know, for instance, on one end of the spectrum, translating an, a scholarly article, on the other, translating a poem. In the former case, the main focus is really the content of the message, what is being said and you want to convey that as accurately as possible in your target language. Now, if the scholar resorts to some literary flourishes in the style, well, you can try to uh, convey those, but that is, as I see it, not really central to the enterprise. Um, apart from sort of amateur attempts to translate to the text of some German leader or art songs, I have generally shied away from translating poetry. But I think poem, you know, the translation of a poem is the perfect example of the really counterexample to the scholarly article. Here, really, what is central is the tone, the figures of speech, and the formal elements that play a role, you know, even if you can speak of the content of a poem, which is far greater than the content. And again, here I kind of want to hark back to my lesson from graduate school that I mentioned before. And that is, you have to convey the reading experience of someone reading the original text, but you have to do it in a way that is possible within the parameters of your target language. Um, so those are, you know, and I thought I'd just close with some reflections on the whole theme of our panel, and that is the whole question of translation as scholarship. And, you know, as it has been mentioned several times before, uh, it used to be the case that translation was, did not count in any regard as scholarship, was regarded by many in the academy as a rather menial task. Uh, I think we're all encouraged to see that that is beginning to change, that people are more and more inclined to view translation as a scholarly activity. And I think one can argue that translation does accomplish a goal comparable to a work of literary criticism or scholarship, which is to interpret a work to make it accessible to a new audience. Um, so let me just close with that. Thank you. Could I have the microphone, please? Okay. All right. Okay, I think, Iren, you wanted to add a little bit about the type of one of the, your projects. You wanted to go into a little more detail. No, I thought that um, you were going to ask us the, the you questions. Okay. Yeah, I, I will do that okay. within the questions. Okay, we yeah. can do that within that context. And I just wanted to make sure that you had the opportunity to tell us about it a little bit more. Now, what I see, listening to all of you, what I hear, actually, mm -hmm. uh, after, you know, I don't know if it's been 15 or 20 minutes, is that each one of you, you're all talking about translation, and 
in a similar context in a way, but at the same time, you're all talking about different types of translation, right? Translating the classics for um, college students or for textbooks, you have a certain type of purpose in mind, a certain type of audience that makes you do certain things and makes certain decisions that someone else would not make doing, you know, with a different type of translation. Uh, an oral translation is a different type, you know, from oral text to written text, from, you know, um, um, from, uh, what language was that? I'm sorry, I can't remember. Fon. From Fon, okay, into French and then into English. And the same thing, you know, um, Thomas referred to, you talked about grammar translation at first, and then you're talking about different genres and different purposes. So it seems to me that the issue of translation as scholarship or in scholarship is closely connected to the issue that the topic, the, the theme, the notion of translation and what people understand when we talk about translation. And in many cases, what's happened in the past in my in my understanding, is that we have a very simplistic notion of translation. And many people out there who made decisions and, and thought about translation, of course, just transferred whatever they thought translation was to other contexts that may not have been the same type of translation. As we get to understand the field a little bit more and the activity, then we start realizing all the differences. And whether we understand translation as scholarship will probably depend on all those subtleties. I mean, that's my understanding of it and what's the recent developments out there in translation. As people get more interested, then all these things start to surface. So um, my question to you would be to sort of elaborate a little bit more on, on your understanding of translation in relation to your, your projects and how that impacts the scholarship aspect of it. You know, my, it, in the sense that it is scholarship because this is what we're doing that is related to scholarship versus someone else's understanding of, for instance, grammar translation, like you mentioned. So I don't know if, if okay, let's go, I mean. Actually, um, I don't need that. Oh, Can okay. you hear me? Uh -huh. Actually, when I read the question, the, the first question, which was, how, why, when, and in what sense can translation be a form of scholarly research? I thought that I would, you know, gently, gently, nicely take issue with the formulation of the question itself. You know, because um, this implies, the way it is formulated, it implies that it's not really trans, uh, scholarship, it's a form of, uh, of um, of uh, scholarly research, and I think that translation is always, always scholarly re research, except of course if somebody asks you to uh, translate their birth certificate, for instance, and even though, you know, uh, even then, uh, if you have a birth certificate of an African person who was born before the the 50s, I would say, you would say, né vers 1945. He was born around 1945. Now, if you don't know the culture, you would say, what? You're born on a date. You're not born, born around a date. And it's because, you know, people said, well, he was born uh, during the last drought. You know, there was not a specific date. So, Apart from, even in those cases, you have to know the culture. But I think that, to me, translation is not just um, translating from one text to the other, from one language to another, but also from a culture to another, or a set of cultures, you know, because Africa is a very large continent, and it makes me mad when people speak about Africa as a country. I always remind my students that there are 54 countries in that con continent. But so there is all the subtleties of, of culture that uh, need to be, um, uh, to be taken into account. The second thing that I have to, to uh, talk about here is the whole politics of translation. What gets translated, what does not get tr translated, for whom, and who makes the decisions. Mm 
right? So I think that that is a very uh, important aspect of translation, even uh, especially in the so-called minority languages or minority cultures. Um, and that's why uh, the work that we did on the translation of African women's poetry is so important, you know, to, to show, first of all, that the poetry exists, right? And also to, to give a, a wider audience to these African women. And I'm going to share that in a minute, but uh, what, what I wanted to say also about that is also the politics of editing because, uh, and, and, uh, and publishing, I want to say, because we wanted on the book of the translation the two titles, the, the, the title in French, une pluie de mots, and in English it's a, a rain of words, and we wanted the two, since it was really a bilingual edition, but the editors refused to have the, the title in French because it was for an American uh, audience. And I said, well, but it could be for an, an African audience as well. So what we did was, you know, in the, um, come on, on, uh, in, on the cover, you know, to have reins, you know, lines that would, and right in between the lines, in plus de mots, in plus de mots, in plus de mots, but they caught it and said, no. Okay, so, well, uh, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's what I have. Well, you know, it's interesting, and this refers also, um, made me think when you were talking about the whole decision about whether to use footnotes. And this really does, uh, you know, and here is where the problem arises when you're translating a text, when you're presenting a text from a different culture to, let's say, an American reading audience, uh, how do you provide the context? How do you provide the cultural context that is necessary? And uh, I mean, for instance, in the essays and speeches I translated, I did use footnotes. There were a number of references to uh, figures in German public life or to events that would not be familiar to an American audience. I have to admit, though, if I'm translating an, a novel or a short story, I would probably feel more reticent because Somehow, you know, again, it gets to the question of genre. I would think you don't want to break the flow of the reading. So I don't have an answer to that question, but I think it is, uh, it is an interesting challenge for translators. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure if I were, if I were translating for a non-academic context, um, I would grapple with that question more seriously. Um, on the other hand, and, and I, I do, I know something of the work of Lawrence Venuti, is that his name? Mm -hmm. um, who has come out for years now, I think, uh, in favor of, of, of translators uncloseting themselves. And I, and I think that that includes things like footnotes and, and why should they be invisible? And you're not, even if you are reading a novel, you're not reading the original author, you're reading something else, someone's version of that novel. Um, but I don't know, I don't work in that genre. Um, it, it works perfectly for me to have footnotes and I couldn't function as a translator without them for what my purpose is. Okay, anyone else? Okay, which I think, I mean, I don't wanna talk too much, I always end up talking too much, but which I think takes us back again to the purpose of what it is that we're trying to do, right? Depending on, on the genre and whatever it is that we're trying to translate in the audience and what we're trying to accomplish, then we may use uh, one resource or the other. Um, any questions from the public? I want to involve the public, the audience, a little bit more. Questions, comments for the panel, for everyone, for. Tom, you, you mentioned translating Thomas Mann. Uh huh. And two of the major translations of the Porter Bow. They have a major error in the novels that you mentioned, Death and Venice. Uh -huh. uh, there's that crucial point where Ashenbach can't decide whether to stay in Venice or uh -huh. leave. Uh -huh. And he's about to leave, and it gets to a climactic point. He's really conflicted. And Thomas Bach switches to present tense. Uh -huh. And it's very effective. It makes it very immediate. Uh -huh. You feel like you're there. Uh -huh. Both. Uh. 
interesting. I'll never forget with Lowe Porter, I, in Dr. Faustus, as a reference to the Händelstadt, the city where Handel, the composer, lived, and the, she translated as the industrial city. Oh. Maybe just <laughs> but just talking about major blunders, uh, that one stuck in my mind. Any other questions, comments from the audience in terms of translation as in scholarship or any other issues that the panelists hit? Well, since you used the word audience, I, I guess I want to return to that. I mean, I talked about how genre is, uh, you know, really an, a crucial dividing issue in different kinds of translation. But I think along with that, the audience, and this really gets back to what David was saying, that if you're translating for a scholarly audience, there's no question the footnotes are appropriate. Uh, but if you are trying to sell a work of fiction to a more general reading public, uh, that's when it will become sort of more problematic. And uh, I, again, I don't have a clear answer to that question. Mm -hmm. Exactly, because, I mean, in my opinion, that basically has to do with what it is that you want to do with it. Someone else? I think, though, <clears throat> in terms of the development of this new phenomenon of international right, I mean, right now, we are exposed to more literature from a larger, a, a broader range of cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, we really have to also attend to translation of scholarship. Most of these people mm -hmm. that get, uh, get translated, and especially in terms of contemporary, they are people of some note, some uh, importance. And there is hardly any study that is being translated from the home countries where these authors are, in some cases, studied. Um, so, I mean, the, the translation as Scholarship also has to have that dimension of translation of scholarship. Right? Uh, I mean, what you're doing with regards to bringing uh, attention to the oral culture, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that, so, I mean, that's, that's where you have translation uh, working as a scholarly filter or scholarly conduit through which mm -hmm. uh, you're doing preservation work. And so, I'm trying, these are also extremely important uh, for our uh, effort to um, recognize different traditions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh. Any other comments? No. Nothing from the panel? Just uh, point. Okay, go ahead. Who, who go does ahead. decide what gets translated? I'd like to hear more about that. Uh, publishers, readers, economics? I would say, I mean, I don't know what all of you think, but I would say in general, I mean, there's a, there's a, a little bit of literature on that, you know, people who work in translation studies, but um, I would say all of the above. And again, I would think it depends on what area you're focusing on. In some areas, the publishers, you know, things that are for the market, the publishers have a bigger say. It may depend on what countries, too. So I don't know what the other panelists. Well, I'm, I'm tempted to be cynical and say, Publishers slash economics and the readers uh, fall somewhere under those two, but um. yes. it's interesting. Eighty-five percent of the work, literary work that get translated to English, are from the three or four languages: French, mm -hmm. German, and some Russian and some Chinese. But really, still French, German are still very prominent. And yet, eighty-five percent of the rest of the title are almost always recommended by the translators. They are the first to That's right. encourage attention. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so it depends on <coughs> where you are in the hierarchy, so to speak, of languages. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was also going to ask a question to the panelists in relation to that, which uh, David, okay, David, David, you have a question? I think in terms of publishability and trans what translated this, one category of text or that has difficulty getting translated is multilingual texts themselves. So code switching texts, texts that mm -hmm. tend to have a lot of code mixing and code in them already. It's almost like it's not the market saying those can't get translated as much as 
translation practice as such doesn't know quite what to do with a text that's partially Puerto Rican Spanish, partially uh, New York you know, dialect. Uh, I was so surprised last uh, yesterday when I was looking for translations of this uh, Langston Hughes poem in German that the poem that one of the major American poets has not been translated. Probably this, this poem, because of its dialectal code blending kind of things, that scares off a lot of translators. So I'm kind of wondering what, what you think about the practice of, of or the practice of politics of translating multilingual texts themselves. Uh, does, does that make sense as a question? Yeah. Well, it's a challenge. I mean, uh, you know, the multilingual text, by definition, I think, prescribes a fairly relatively limited audience who can fully appreciate all the aspects of that text. And then if you translate it, I mean, how do you reproduce the, you know, the correspondence of New York English and uh, Puerto Rican Spanish, you know, let's say for a German reading audience? I mean, it's, uh, you, I mean, you might have to come up with analogous dialects, you know, and then really use your imagination, sort of take a huge leap and try to recreate, you know, maybe uh, uh, some, uh, you know, a, a Swiss native in the middle of Berlin or something, but, uh, you know. Yeah. Actually, no, no, go ahead. no, go, no, no. Okay. No, actually, um, I, I, the, um, the colleague who translated The Reign of Words with me, she's doing something like that. She read all the translations of Toni Morrison in French. And she said that, you know, the, the, the African-American language, if you will, the, the tones, the kinds of, um, of um, codes, you know, that they have, um, that it's completely flattened. And so uh, she is redoing those trans translation, and she has a theory that she calls the transatlantic um, translation theory, in which, in fact, she's, she tries to see in which way you can render that idiom that is specific, specifically African American. <coughs> right. So, um, I, I, is it on this that you wanted to talk? Yeah. So why don't you, and then I'll come back to your question. Yeah. I was just going to ask if, um, if um, anyone, uh, if this is something that you would recommend to Well, that's an interesting point. I guess, you know, I would still think that a writer, a, a reader who would be enticed by that, even if that reader was not, did not have mastery of, let's say, all three languages, would still be a fairly literate, you know, person, someone who really was open to that kind of interplay of different languages, which, you know, we like to think that's a large audience, um, but, um, I think certainly, yeah, yeah. No, I, I see the point you're making that that would really uh, at least offer different points of access to the text. And I'm wo I'm wondering in which um, in which sense sense we we can use the uh, the new technologies like you know translate stuff and put it on online, you know, because the question that you pose poses, a, I mean, uh, brings up the problem of finding publishers. You know, you may want to do that. Mm -hmm. the, the, the audience will be limited, but it's still interesting. But will 
there be enough people that it was going to be financially worthwhile for an editor to do that? So maybe that's where we can explore uh, working on the internet and, you know. Okay, and the other thing that I wanted, I wanted to, um, uh, to respond to what you said or comment to what you said about um, preserving the culture by translating it. And this morning, um, there was some questions about um, um, ethical questions, you know. Um, for instance, I go to Benin, and I go to villages to record all these, uh, these songs that have existed for a long time. But at the same time, there is a kind of resistance, you know, too, because you know, now with globalization, they know that they can record these things, but there is at the same time a kind of um, uh, protection, mm -hmm. you know, of, of, uh, of that. And so the ethical question is, you know, what right do I have to make it, you know, to take it out of its context if the people themselves, you know, want to keep it that way? So that was uh, one question. But the idea, at the same time, it, it is in uh, contradiction with the idea of wanting to show it to the world because it exists. And I have here a, um, a quote by um, Ngugi Wationgo, who is a writer from, uh, from uh, Kenya. And um, his latest book is called Something Torn and New an African Renaissance. And um, he attributes the fragmentation of Africa to what he calls Europhonism. And he describes it as a replacement of native names, native languages, native identities with European ones. And he says that the result was a dismemberment not only of African people, but also of African memory. And one way of remembering, in the sense that uh, Toni Morrison uses, remembering the memory, but remembering, putting all the members together, um, uh, not only of African people, but also of African memory, is through translation that he calls a patriotic act in this context. So. There you go. <laughs> yeah. I think some of the other questions that we were hoping to address, in a way you've already touched on those issues, but I still like to just bring them to the foreground a little bit more and recapitulate on what you said so far. And it's, I mean, we were talking about scholarship and it is very clear that, that uh, putting some of these oral traditions into a written form and translating them is very clear as a form of scholarship. So if we turn it around, how, I mean, I think, again, we've already talked about this, but how does that also <coughs> influence you and your own scholarship in terms of your other work and your other scholarship? And I'm using the example that you mentioned, but I'm also, you know, wanting to see how David and Thomas see that. How does that affect your own scholarship, your own work, and at the same time, not just your own work, but how does translation in general affect scholarship and research in the humanities, in the social sciences? What role does it play? Well, one point I wanted to make, and this gets back to the point you made earlier, that one thing to be said for translation is it really intensifies your reading experience. It really makes you a much more discerning reader. And so I think that, that to me was an interesting insight. And uh, I think that, that certainly speaks to one way in which translation feeds into your scholarship as well. Yeah, and I would just agree with that, that um, I'm writing a book on Roman comedy and there, there are 26 extant comedies. I wish I could translate them all before I go undertake those larger interpretive leaps. Um, because there is no closer intimacy with the text, uh, no way you can achieve that uh, other than through translating. It's, 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 it's a great experience. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, I, I agree also with this idea, you, you know, um, that it teaches you to be better readers. As I say, <laughs> everything has, has been said, and we come to Taite D.A. in some les derniers. Anyway, but um, yeah, I think that, as I said before, but I want to say it in another way. Um, that uh, meaning is not only located in words, but it has an, uh, a very close link with the culture from which those words emanates. Okay, so uh, it, it has, of course, um, influenced my scholarship, but also my teaching, because I teach courses in literature in translation. And pedagogically, I think it's important to show students that that is a translation because, you know, the invisibility of the translator that you were talking about, they read those texts without knowing that they are, well, they know that the course is called African Literature in Translation. But you, you have to let them know all the time and make the translator visible and use the translation uh, to, uh, to um, as a critical tool also, as it was said this morning. Um, but now, when you say uh, translations you know, in, um, in the humanities, I would say that uh, translation has helped shape disciplined, disciplines and even has helped determine and define disciplines. Where would the English departments in North America be without the translations of Foucault, Derrida, and Deleuze, for instance. So the, those translations have shaped what happens in English departments even more than they do in French departments, you know, at this point. So, um, and everybody's talked about the globalization. One of the good aspects of globalization has been the fact that the, you know, we are moving from culture to culture, we are more open to the world, we, we have more opportunity to know uh, each other through translation. Now, I think that what we have to do is to continue the fight so that it, it is recognized as a scholarship that it is. I was telling a group earlier that uh, when I came to, to the United States, what I wanted to do was translation. And there were a few schools that could uh, you know, um, teach me how to do this. And secondly, uh, one of my mentors said, why do you do this? You'll never have a, you'll never have a, uh, a career in the academic world through translation. Just forget it. So this new development is really exciting, you know. That's, that's very interesting. I actually like to take a survey and see how many people have gone through that exact same experience, the exact same thing happened to me. I approach at the MA level, I approach a professor and I said, and this was in the US, I said, I want to do translation, I want to do a PhD in translation. He said, don't even think about it. You know, that's academic, this was you know, academic suicide. And this was about 20 years ago, so things are changing significantly. Mm -hmm. Else? Well, in my case, it would be more than 20 years ago, and it wasn't even, I mean, I was always fascinated by it, but I never even had the illusion that You I were too bright. <laughs> no, no, it was just... No, you, yeah, you followed their directions. Yeah. yeah. I did both. Um, any other comments, questions about this? Any other questions for the panel? Mm -hmm. um, but that the fact that we have 
But um, <coughs> the goal is not to be so production of content, uh, oftentimes from Anglican sources. Um, that's, that's the world we live in now. And, and what can translation, translation scholars do to open up a different alternative? I want to also say something, because you mentioned this before, David, that you know, Google's uh, uh, platform is very interesting. You probably know this. When you ask to translate something like say, from Turkish to English, what it does is it surveys existing translations. Mm -hmm. and, and then based on the recurrent mm -hmm. translations of the same word, yeah. they, it gives you what it, thinks, it, it, it says that is correct. Now, but in a way then, the people who are working in Google to improve this uh, machinery are themselves translators. I mean, Google is in fact waiting for us to keep translating because that's their accuracy depends on the availability of translation. So there is also a way to uh, benefit from that synergy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I just don't need oh, oh, I don't need it. No, I, I'm, I'm sure that many people now are aware of this MLA thing that's called um, Evaluating Translations as Scholarship Guidelines for Peer Review, which is really, when I saw that, I just almost fainted. Because, you know, as we know, MLA is, uh, you know, is a sacrosanct mm -hmm. um, gatekeeper you know, of, of our profession. And for them to come up with this is just quite uh, remarkable. So I think we're on the right track, David. <laughs> well, I think with this, we can close the panel. Have you seen panel. that? No. And, it's quite um, amazing. David, I don't know if you have anything else to say to close the event, or we just Thank go you. in. Thank you particularly to our, our guests from Iowa, from Turkey, and also from uh, our speakers here on campus. Thank you so much. Please join us for, uh, for a meal right outside. Uh, Thank you.